So uh, I tend to start with an overview slide. Uh, Amanda provided an excellent introduction to that. One of the things is to provide you as guidance as a university, so Arizona State, you know, 130,000, 140,000 people organized in different types of uh, sections and platforms. Uh, Sam and I lead a research group of which 30 of those folks com uh, comprise and then have extended collaborations out to about 10 different vendors and subcontractors on work and have funding from about 15 different sources uh, focused at turning uh, good ideas from basic science and applied research into working prototypes, uh, changing workforce, which is today's topic, but then also changing policy and processes. Uh, we've had the great fortune over the last several years to be involved in several different discussions and conversations uh, on Hawaii or with Hawaii partners. Uh, part of those are with the County of Hawaii and dockets and information going on through the Hawaii PUC for energy regulation, but then also with the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute on one of our more recent projects financed by the Office of Naval Research that's focused on distribution systems and resiliency. So a little bit about why, uh, uh, what's going on and where the industry, industry is changing to. So just if you look at microgrids, which is essentially a, a smaller miniature grid, which can be separated or island from the larger electric grid, just that type of technology is expected to be a four, $40 billion market here in a couple of years, just that one system. So where you saw the solar industry 10 years ago is where we're expecting the microgrid industry to be um, right now, and then the microgrid industry 10 years from now is where you see solar. So massive growth, significant costs, uh, uh, cost reductions, and increased technical potential. And through that, and the, the, the technology percent renewables by 2045, other states are moving to similar goals and internationally. So how do you provide the need for the society that's, that's changing and whether the demands are? So we work with utilities, we work with the Defense Department, we work in humanitarian entities and organizations. We've been fortunate over the last uh, eight to 10 years to provide goods and services that support uh, the lives and well-being of over 5 million people worldwide, uh, principally in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia, and then in the last couple of years with more grid modernization and critical infrastructure on uh, U.S. soil. So as this growth is occurring and we look at ourselves as a university, typical university processes uh, focus on uh, um, creation of publishable artifacts if you think about the research that they do. We are an R1 or a research institution at Arizona State and that's one of the many ways that we look at our <coughs> metrics and our impact to society. However, in our team and in many teams at Arizona State, we realize that innovation and products need to go beyond publications. And so having spent more time in my life in the private sector than I have in academia, I then also put on a business hat and I say, what is the consumer ethnographic stories being trained as an engineer and also as an anthropologist? What are the business models or the mission model canvas they might say from a humanitarian perspective? And going through a variety of different pilot tests, prototypes, and methodologies so that we're creating and translating the basic science to apply to research to prototypes to field implementation for actual tangible benefit to humanity on the scale of months instead of years. And we take those, those silo disciplines instead of just basic science, working in a lab, working in the field, or developing prototypes, and we combine those together at Arizona State and also with a partnership network, which we're very happy to say includes UH Manoa. Now, the end goal of all these leads into innovations in technology, process, and people. And we actually just spent the, the better part of the week at Kanyoe Bay working with Marine Corps Installation, uh, Marine Corps Base Hawaii there, and Marine Corps Installations Command on understanding that as they're changing in terms of their needs and what they're doing on behalf of the American people and broader world stability, how do we think about innovation in the defense mindset? And through that, it's not always just technology. So we do work, we provide policy solutions, warranty and resiliency. And what we often say is, uh, you know, it's great if you want to install backup generators, solar and storage to be more resilient, but how do you monetize that? And so we work with a variety of groups on providing resiliency with an ROI. When I think about microgrid applications, so who are we training and for what reason? Um, there is a, roughly a billion people globally that don't have access to power. That's where I got started was actually in humanitarian actions and reliefs, is providing power to people that didn't have it. Next is you would have refugee camps, which we'd be happy to, we've been happy to work in Lebanon, Jordan, and most recently Uganda, which I'll talk a little bit about later. 
and then getting to disaster response, Puerto Rico, Haiti, and other locations that have suffered some form of uh, um, a natural disaster, maybe even a kinetic attack or a cyber attack, and so they're weakened or, or damaged. Lastly, with remote on-grid locations, uh, such as at the end of a long electrical feeder, campuses, uh, Arizona State, four different campuses, students on them, looking at how do we uh, grow those campuses and capabilities to provide um, lower economics, more sustainability, having 40 megawatts of solar now at Arizona State, but then also exporting that benefit to the neighboring communities. We do this and we look at that, not just with those academic, <clears throat> excuse me, that academic hat and that business mindset and humanitarian hat, we say, well, if we're already doing this work for the civilian sector, how do we extend that and provide uh, benefits to the defense sector and then also to the humanitarian sector? And so we think about designing a technology, we think about the market opportunity or the needs landscape so that when we do one thing, it can meet multiple goals, which provides greater benefit to society. And so that's our approach, a little bit of who we work with, which we'll talk about later. Um, I'm also super happy to have uh, Samantha Janko with me uh, today, who's the managing director of my lab, as uh, Amanda indicated. And she's going to speak to you about our specific training and workforce development uh, offerings. And then at the end, I'm going to come back up to the stage and tell you a little bit about how that training is being implemented uh, in industry and academia and the humanitarian sector today on specific projects. Um, so kind of just getting started here. We have taken a very holistic approach to the way we teach microgrids and the way we teach um, energy, energy technology as a whole. We prefer to think of it in terms of uh, it's an entire process, all the way from thinking that you need one to understanding if you need one to how do you design it, how do you think through all of the pieces you need, how do you fund it, how do you have the business model set up, all the way to the end goal of you know, having something that's operational and can be maintained and, um, and, and functional. So we have some, some training offerings listed here. There's actually a few more that didn't make it on this slide, and I'm going to go over those in a little bit as well. But I kind of like to, to share, too, that we really started this out um, uh, with sort of our volunteer time. So we, at first, we kind of started this with, with no um, funding behind it. We kind of just got together and said this would be a really neat opportunity to teach um, people about a topic that thing called the microgrid boot camp. Um, it was a five-day long training uh, starting from understanding basics of microgrids, like I said, kind of starting at the very beginning of why do you need one, do you need one, if you need one. And then um, Tuesday kind of covers like a high level design technique that we use, um, we use pretty much daily in our lab. We think through how to select and size assets. Uh, Wednesday is a very hands-on day. We are a very applied lab. We like people to actually touch and feel what they're learning. So we have um, in our uh, one acre microgrid test bed, we have all of these uh, tools and components that people can go and actually play and work with in a safe environment. And then Thursday, we have more of a detailed sort of electrical engineering uh, style uh, simulation environment that we teach people um, about microgrids and, and all of the electrical distribution pieces that go into it. And then Friday, we just have some fun and go to some local utilities and do tours. It's, it went over really, really well. We had a really good time doing it. And do you want me to show the video sure. now? Sure. Yes, yeah, so we got a little video that kind of introduces you to that concept. And it started out as just being for um, ASU student veterans, which was kind of a neat, a neat concept. Um, but we've actually moved beyond that, too. So we have participants from, from all kinds of backgrounds provide power to 1.4 billion people that don't have it today, one of the mechanisms to do that is by providing containerized microgrids or rapid deployable power systems that are easy to design, manufacture, and then also uh, install, operate, and maintain. When we look at where the microgrid industry is evolving, so in uh, two years from now, in 2020, it's expected to be a $40 billion industry around the world. So there's a big technology push from vendors making microgrid technologies. There's also a big demand from people that want microgrid technologies. And we asked the question at a university, who's gonna train the people to do the work? And so the way we approach that is we provide a series of modules up to 200 hours of training in microgrid design, installation, operation, maintenance, and undoubtedly safety. So we have a couple different boot camps that we put on. We have different hardwares that we will put around in trailers. And we'll actually are uh, ramping up and trying to expand to give people the knowledge about different types of energy systems, not only microgrids, but actually thinking more holistically about solutions for their specific needs. We have a load bank back here that we can simulate different load profiles for different buildings or actual forward operating bases. So we can actually run all of this equipment 
and the controls that we develop through the gauntlet make sure it can actually function and be operational out in the real world. I currently work for the Space and Naval Warfare Research Center, where I currently do research on uh, energy technologies, uh, mostly evaluating new technologies coming out for energy efficiency. Partnering with ASU, is, we see that as a huge opportunity to leverage what they already have going on um, as far as hardware in a loop testing, uh, training, um, getting these devices with pe uh, people get hands on them to where they can actually play around with them, test them out, see what they like about them, what they don't like about them, and give some feedback on them more than just reading data sheets and kind of theoretical papers and everything. I have a lot of ideas coming from this boot camp. There, there's a lot that happened this, so far this week. Being able to look at the components and looking inside the components and looking at how the components communicate with each other has been very enlightening to me on how these real-world technologies are, are functioning. I learned two different programs that I didn't know existed. So I'm an officer in the United States Army Reserve, and I didn't know that there's a track for engineers in the Army to help with uh, energy and the relief efforts uh, in the engineering corps. Since I wasn't uh, big on understanding how components or equipment got the power, it was just, all right, the power was there. I just turn on the equipment that, and fix what's necessary. Here, it's trying to, like, uh, using the Medusas, like, with all the different numbers and all the computers. It's like, all right, this is what happens if we're doing this or if this situation comes in, and it's just a lot of information, and I'm trying to gather it all and learn. I had an idea, but I didn't know the power or the potential behind it until this workshop. And so that's what the university, especially ASU with the microgrid workshop has done. So it opened up a whole new realm to, we knew it was there, but takes away the scare factor. And so that's what I'm glad for. Attending a training like this, where you can meet and collaborate with other people in the field or, or in related fields, but you're gaining experience that can really give you a leg up in industry, but also um, give you the personal confidence to work on systems like this. Because sometimes when you leave school, you don't feel confident in your ability to work on what you learned. Our intent is increased reliability, keep the lights on, economics, keep the costs low, and sustainability, make the power greener. We look to grow together to see how Arizona State can impact the globe. Um, yeah, that gave a pretty, a pretty good overview. Uh, but what we found, what we found working through uh, this particular program, which is a heck of a lot of fun, by the way, and we are doing one in March, plugging that. Um, yeah, we're doing another one. I wish now down at our, our lab. part of our discussions <laughs> this morning, but it will likely, but it'll be a little bit further down the road. Right. Have you talked to Maui College yet? Uh, we were talking with the, not Maui College, we were meeting with the, uh, the UH Community College representatives of workforce development this morning. Okay. So they do the solar for vets, um, and so since this is related to that, um, the question now is we're going to have a training assessment, which we're going to uh, add um, the UH content to this, the assessment that we typically send out, and then we'll have a, a co-branded UH um, ASU uh, training assessment that then goes out to individuals and organizations and they can say which is the most interest, which will help us craft out of the 300 hours we have, what, what aspects of those do we provide. Mm -hmm. So that would be a great connection actually with Valley College. Just, I just bring it up because about 20 years ago they start, they established the Sustainable Living Institute, SLIM. Okay. And their focus was on this kind of thing um, with different different in industries, so it wasn't just it actually wasn't even energy at the time. So I don't know where they've come to, okay. but I'm sure they'd be very very interested. I think it's particularly interesting too because they are the first campus in the United States to be 100% renewable. Yeah, Maui campus, mm -hmm. ASU's lagging behind at whatever 87% or something. So that's another <laughs> interesting. Um, Hey, we're trying. Yeah, which is good. You're about to make a canvas. It's true. Good insight. David Lays is very Thank proud you. of the 100% renewable. Sounds like a, a visit imminent. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, yeah, and what we kind of learned from doing, doing this five-day course is that uh, as we started to expand and have people from a wide variety of backgrounds and not just U.S student veterans interested in energy. Like we had a very particular set of people and then we expanded out. And what we found is that not everybody is interested in every tidbit. Um, many people are actually only interested in the part that helps them in their career paths. Or you know, if they're a, someone working at a utility, for instance, might not 
care so much about the, the um, some of the really deep details of electrical engineering. If they don't have to do the buildings, they aren't building the systems themselves. They're you know more on the the planning side or something like that. So um, the early planning side. So what we did is we said, okay, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. And this is still fun and we still do it, but we've started to think a little bit more in terms of master classes. So two to three day workshops on a particular set of topics. Um, I was not at this event in particular, but this is pretty similar to, to what we what we'd usually do is we have a piece that's classroom. So we sit down and teach some theory and then we have a hands-on portion that um, we kind of, uh, sometimes we bring our trailer out, which you can see in the bottom right, or our smaller kits to kind of show, give people a hands-on experience with the, with the technology and the things that we learned in the classroom. Uh, this particular event had 10 attendees. Um, I think that was last year. Uh, yes. I'm, last summer. Yeah, I'm losing, losing track of time over here. Um, and from those, the, that class, you know, we, we found that that model is starting to work a little bit better than just having a straight up five day, five day uh, workshop. Um, and the bottom right corner of this one should be World Bank. We did the this one with the World Bank before we, I believe, before we started working with ONR, maybe at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah. This this one was really neat. This was actually the 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 project that that started the development of that trailer in the top right. So we made this 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 trailerized microgrid system, uh, very small scale in terms of the components within it, but accessible enough for people to be able to understand the components of a microgrid system. And we kind of constructed it all within three weeks and <laughs> shipped it out to uh, DC and put it out on the street and taught people. And this, 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 this set of topics and the hands-on integration part here are the same as the other um, master class. We had a sit-down part where we talked about uh, system sizing and, and design, and then we had a hands-on part where people could play with some stuff. Um, and yeah, and you could see that we had all kinds of people come off the street. There's a little girl there, too, that happened to come by, which was pretty neat. If I add sure. This. So this was a bit unique. So we've been training um, student veterans, and then utility professionals, technology providers, electrical engineers, and then we started to move into training managers. And so the World Bank uh, invited us to go help um, lead. It was about a 150-person workshop within the scope of a 600-person event in Nigeria. And the reason they selected Nigeria is because they're going to be uh, providing loans, uh, $350 million in loans over the next five years to do mini-grids or off-grid microgrids in Nigeria, just that one country, just that one country. And now you have country-level managers for the World Bank giving out uh, writing tenders and giving out loans on technology they haven't encountered before. So this was literally to give these managers that are granting out millions of dollars in loans some form of um, uh, tactics, uh, like a hands-on experience with what are they, what you look for when you're receiving bids, and everything along that lines. So it's been the scope of what's needed to hit that $40 billion market is expanding rapidly. So we're expanding our training programs commensurately. Right. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, from those workshops, over time, we've kind of come up with some different different workshops on focused on different topics. This one um, is a grid resiliency workshop, so it kind of is focused on how the different infrastructure pieces work well work together or don't work together when a when a threat is is imminent. And um, we have a, a software called Rise that actually simulates those two infrastructure in this case two infrastructures or three or four infrastructures, and all your happen and figure out how to mitigate it. Um, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then uh, most of the courses and workshops that we do do not result in credit, but this this one does. Uh, this is a semester-long course that Nate offers on some of the topics that I just referred to in some of the other workshops, and then also we include some hands-on labs and things um, as well. Is there anything else you wanted to say about that one? Just briefly, is well, we have enough um, uh, content to do up to about 15 credits, of which seven, to, uh, seven are currently proved to go to degrees. The other thing inside of credits, we offer certificates, but then also is professional credentialing. So like the North American Electrical Liability Corporation or NERC certification is, is required for grid operators. There's no microgrid operator certified, but now we're working with folks on developing the standards, which is going to the requirements that define, here's the certification skills you would need to be a microgrid operator, microgrid expert. And so that's helping um, uh, provide back to the broader aspects of the energy industry. Mm -hmm. We found that we were creating a lot of content and we wanted to reach a lot more people. So we said, okay, how can we get this online and uh, be able to distribute it um, more uh, more widely? And so last year we received a, um, 
uh, grant that allows us to create 20 hours worth of content that we're actually going to provide for free to the Navy. Um, and then building off of those 20 hours of content, we have about, mm, I think we're pushing to 60 or 80 hours over this next uh, year or so with another grant that we just got. Um, but this is kind of the structure of some of the stuff we're going to put online for now, which is some of those basics. Um, the selecting and sizing assets piece, a little bit of the electrical engineering, and then that commissioning and deployment part I'm pretty excited about. We're going to try and do some, some neat internet tricks to get people to feel involved with the, with the hands-on activities. Um, Nate mentioned a little bit about this NERC certification and grid operator training. Power for Vets is a program provided by one of our uh, partners, Inksys, and they have this real-time electric grid simulation program that looks a lot like what you would see if you were sitting in front of a computer running a, running a grid system. And it's got these like self-guided lessons and videos and things that let people um, experiment and learn about uh, faults and how to, to take care of the system. Um, some, some of the basics that you would need to take that certification and then they also had some supporting documentation that kind of fills in the gaps of everything else you would need to take that. Uh, take that. Did, did you folks create the Power for Vets program? That was that adopted from somewhere else? Uh, yeah, the Inksys, the company, has the Power for Vets program and then we provide some of the back-end electrical engineering software and computation that goes into their user interface. Uh, they've been doing this for about 25 years. Um, we're the only university that has partnered with them to offer credit. Uh, and you can sign up online. Um, individual C licenses will provide the pricing for you there. And then given our partnership and the work we do with them, we're able to, to receive a, re a good discount. And then with uh, support from uh, the DOD or other groups, we give um, free, uh, free memberships um, to, 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 to students. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I've been through that course myself, and it was... Very comprehensive. Um, and then recently we started looking into how can we actually do these operator uh, trainings on specific locations and specific equipment. So that's a picture there of, um, uh, is it Marine Corps Base Miramar? Uh, Marine Corps Air Station. Mar Marine Corps Air Station uh, Miramar. And they have a microgrid that they're putting in and uh, they're interested in having us come help train some of their people to work on it, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's just another example of a, of a different workshop we did. This is still with that Inksys um, uh, simulator of a, of a power system. This was really neat. This actually focused on cyber and kinetic attacks on power systems, which is... Uh, and it was really neat. They, they taught everything about, you know, how if you hack into the system, it's more than just, you know, turning everything off. Like, they can spoof data for days, and you would have no idea. So... Um, learning how to detect uh, pieces of information like that, and then also learning how to reroute power once it's actually happened or uh, you need to take care of something. And then this one was actually really neat. They had sort of this red team, blue team exercise where we did attack and defend scenarios, which was really, really fun. Most people just ended up swearing and mad at each other, but it was... Um, and this one uh, has continuing education credits for that same NERC, um, NERC certification route. Okay, so recently, and uh, starting up in June, we have a, a new grant through ONR STEM, um, which allows us to push not only some of the workshops that we're already doing and expanding those, but also uh, more of the online content and now in the K through 12 and post-secondary education realm, which is really exciting for me. I went to community college in Arizona, and so I'm excited to start pushing a little bit into the community college space. Uh, so we're going to have one hour and two-day interactive workshops, as well as this this kit that we're creating called a microgrid on a desk, which is a small scale version of a, of a microgrid system. Um, if you're familiar with a breadboard, the idea of being able to plug and play different pieces on a, on a little board to help you understand the connections, and then also some of the more detailed topics specific to microgrids. And we're also gonna include some internships and externships in there as well. Online content is kind of boring. I was I was homeschooled too, so when I was homeschooled, I did a lot of online classes. And if you sit there in front of a computer watching videos and reading stuff for hours, it gets old fast, and you're not paying attention, and you're not actually absorbing the information the way you should be. So thinking it more in the realm of okay, if we if we can't send someone to you, and you don't have someone there to help facilitate your your learning. How can we create a guide for you or create a, um, a piece of software that can help guide you through your, your, your homework problems, your, um, your readings, and, and, and kind of watch and learn from you about how you're, you're learning and uh, sort of support you. So we're looking into this digital coaching idea. This is uh, probably going to be a topic for a future grant but is not currently in place.
Good. Yeah. That's about it. I'd like to say digital coaching is something that the Global Academy at ASU uses, right? When people are doing, if I'm in Afghanistan and I'm wanting to do an online module, I have a coach assigned to me to help me through that. So I think that's a really interesting mm. concept. And is that a person? Of, I don't know if it's a personal yeah. AI. I just know the Global Freshman Academy right. has that ability. And you can yeah. actually do a module for free, and then if you want to get credit, mm -hmm. university mm -hmm. credit for it, you pay $55. So it's this whole idea of the democratization of learning and how do we get that out to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to have internet access. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not yet for everybody, but it's a really in interesting, innovative idea. And it's uh, particularly as you have more online individuals uh, looking to work with you and take education. Uh, uh, CSU San Marcos, we were visiting last week, does a really good job about providing personalized coaching through uh, one hour to four hours with each individual, and it's all remote-based Zoom. Um, our, our objective in this is to actually have an advanced version of the Microsoft Paperclip. And so it's actually understanding how you're clicking through things, and when you're designing something or controlling something in real time, it's like, mm, you may not want to do that because there's a high likelihood of a grid outage. And so then it'll provide you with, as well, based upon your proficiency, a tailored set of skills, kind of like you know, a find your own way through a story, to give you that next concept or credential which matches your current capability without knowing anything about your background. And so that's where we're working, where we're looking to go. Um, one thing I like to add, uh, so Sam was sharing a good amount and was talking about ONR, World Bank, and then there's also training that's been financed by USAID. ONR those, is the Office for Naval Research. Thank oh, you. Yeah, yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So those groups. Um, provided the, the funding for content development, noting that we started to do this uh, all as a volunteer effort. And we didn't realize the, the demand that we'd to hear from people. And then all of a sudden, after that demand, word got up to folks uh, that sponsored grants and said, you need to go talk to these guys. And so they came out and talked to us, and we crafted something together there. But uh, just uh, in, in the, the way that the content was funded through federal sources, the delivery is out to many broader sectors in that. So we've had utilities come in that I mentioned, energy regulators come in, uh, we've had small medium-sized enterprises, uh, solar installers, storage vendors, and a variety of other folks from a variety of different professions. And uh, with the benefit of having the federal funding, it allows us to reduce the cost by 50 to 75% because we don't need to seek a return on investment for the amount of time that we put in to develop the training content. So we keep the costs uh, quite low uh, versus some um, uh, commercial partners that are also looking to uh, do similar training. Now, what I wanted to do and kind of end, I'm just doing a quick time check. I'll take maybe maybe five minutes to do a couple highlights of some projects. So we're doing workforce development, and we train people. A lot of those people are also our existing employees in network or want to come work for us afterwards. And so I wanted to share with you a few of the projects that they're working on so you understand, okay, where did these people go and what did they do? Now they go work for GE utilities um, in a variety of different areas, some of them humanitarian groups in, in Haiti and elsewhere, but then also some of them stay with us. So I want to highlight some of those. Are they working with any of the large consulting firms? I mean, I noticed you, you quoted Navigant. Are they working? Are you getting them out? Boston Consulting yeah. Group specifically, uh, Deloitte as well. Um, you'd have some um, uh, Burns and Mac is another one. Um, uh, I don't think we have anyone that went to work for Black and Veatch right now, but some of those larger I firms, Siemens. Down. Uh, Booz Allen, we just spent uh, last, <laughs> we, we spent the week with them. At Booz Allen, we haven't, no. Specifically not with them. Mm. Uh, let's see. So one, of the, so one of the example projects that I was mentioned earlier with Sam was a containerist microgrid solution. And when we were working with NRG Renew, at the, which at the time was the largest producer, largest independent power producer in the entire world, and they said, hey, uh, we've seen what's gone on in Haiti and elsewhere, and we're a big producer of power, but uh, you know what? Um, uh, those, those assets are not meeting what we need for power. And by the way, we also need mobilized power. Now, a lot of people have put power in Connex boxes. We're not the first ones to do it. We provide a flexible solution so you can actually pick up the phone, put in an order, and in two to four weeks, we'll have a semi-customized solution uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, FOB, ready for you to pick up. And so that's the, the, the speed of which we do it. Now, what's interesting when we did the prototype for this is we went to a conversation uh, at a conference and a napkin drawing, and uh, three months later, we've completed um, contracting, um, 
benchmarking, conceptual design, detailed electrical engineering, procurement of parts, fabrication, uh, testing, and then uh, um, uh, permitting. And so it was like, how do you take a real world idea and make it fast? And all, also, by the way, this was a senior design project. And so you had four people in their last year of their senior career do this, which then led into their, their careers today. Uh, similar of that is in uh, Uganda, we picked up another project, and the Office of Naval Research were the ones that financed the prototype because they do a lot of humanitarian actions around the world, coastal, obviously, um, and the first responders, and they transition that responsibility to USAID, UNHCR, other types of groups. Now, uh, we said, okay, people knew we did power, we did water and systems, but what about health? And so then this is actually a little bit bigger. We've been able to, through some innovation, reduce the power and water down to about 15 feet, so we have 25 feet of a primary care clinic. And then the Office of Naval Research grant we had was to build a prototype. And then we worked with a couple nonprofits, uh, Medical Teams International, Cure, the largest donator of medical supplies worldwide, and a few other groups to actually translate this to Uganda. So we're going to be finishing fabrication in early March. It'll ship to Uganda. It'll be turnkey to provide um, support for 36,000 people who are South Sudanese refugees. And next week, we're actually traveling to Portland to talk to Medical Teams International about how do you do more of these in Bangladesh and other locations in the world. While you're here, yeah. you should talk to Aloha Medical Missions. Oh, that'd be great, actually. Yeah, they okay. work throughout the Pacific. Excellent. Yeah. Thank Alo you. Aloha Medical, Medical Mission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep, actually, I already summarized this. It's just the players and the folks involved um, on the left for the product, prototyping and manufacturing, uh, shipping and logistics. And then here are some pictures of the particular location um, uh, with support from the Office of the Prime Minister, and then a local NGO, Sister of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and then Medical Teams International locally as well. Because not only are we creating things, but noting that I've done work in 20 countries right now, done product and business development. If you don't have an idea of what's going to happen after you implement, then you really don't have a plan, do you? Mm -hmm. So that was a, the long-term goal, and we'll provide at least five years of warranty and maintenance support um, for this Nate, project. Talk a little bit about what you have on campus at ASU in terms of the little village with the different... Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Amanda. So um, we have a one-acre space where we do off-grid technologies and on-grid technologies. And I've realized um, in the work uh, it's, it's easier to engineer something that you can see. And it's also a lot easier to take a five-minute walk instead of a $5,000 trip. And so as a result of work, working in different locations of the world, we've sectioned off part of that area, that one-acre land, for a sustainable community. And what I mean by that is we have five dwellings from around the world that we've actually built there. And that's where students, staff, faculty, anyone can walk in and have an immersive conversation of what is life like in a favela? What is life like in a steel lean-to? What is life like in a Wadland Abhud in West Africa? And that has been super informative. Mm -hmm. Are um, we going to visit museum after this to see what interest there might be in doing a sustainability exhibit that might include this kind of idea for the Pacific. Mm -hmm. I'll skip a little bit over this. We've done work in energy management systems with a variety of different partners, utilities, as well as Verizon. Um, installing and creating microgrid systems. So, you know, uh, Hank Rogers, Blue Planet Energy, uh, the Big Island. So this is one of their prototype systems. And so they contracted out our team to do the testing and evaluation before they went to market on that system. Um, it's integrated with a variety of different assets. Ajito is one of our partners out in Fort Collins uh, that has a Schneider back end for the folks at Lower Burke Building Control Systems in the room. And then we add our uh, controls onto theirs. And so again, it's leveraging existing technologies and partners and then taking that fast design, uh, uh, basic science to applied researches and adding it onto systems to help reduce fuel costs and create a more resilient system. Uh, another group that we work with is uh, Zindi. Uh, they also go by the name Bakeable Energy. They're in uh, San Diego. Uh, their largest support and work to date is the FAA every 10 years redoes their entire electrical infrastructure that provides power to radar stations. Uh, this next 10-year effort is going to be about $3 billion, and they're utilizing the Zindi platform for design as well as program uh, management in that. Uh, and so we do a variety of different controls work with that, with them. We apply it on different examples. We create training guides, and that's led into a lot of different uh, projects. Uh, so we're in conversations right now with the demand that we're seeing, how do we rapidly grow to meet that? A few selections that those training graduates have worked on. Um, 
Uh, up in Canada, there's an $800 million sustainable community. And so the community developers came to me and said, okay, we want to be green. We want to be zero water. We want to be zero waste, net everything. What does that look like? Uh, what are the technologies out there? What are the financial models? And then also we're going to have a conversation with the utility and water authority. So can you help us manage that? So a lot of master planning for my team supporting. And then also one of my colleagues down in Haiti, some of the training graduates helped work at in five isolated communities, 13,000 homes. Do you do separate electrical systems for each village? Do you put them together? If they're all connected together, do you put all the generation one location versus another? And then you look at the effects on reliability, resiliency, and economics, as well as if once you provide power to a community um, or that significant step change, uh, the social dynamic or the political structure of the community could also be affected, and so having those conversations as well. Uh, one, I think this is last thing, on RISE is the resilient infrastructure simulation environment. So if you can design it now, since the, um, the intensity as well as frequency of weather events is increasing, and now we're having more worry for cyber attacks and potentially kinetic strikes, where might you be vulnerable in your infrastructure? So we take infrastructure models uh, that are already uh, open source, developed. We're not going to recreate the wheel and the basic math there. But we combine all those together, which other folks haven't done. And then we provide a human uh, interface, a human um, uh, a graphical user interface, sorry, uh, for humans to look and work at. And then we hold a variety of different workshops, events, et cetera, and we throw different threats. So much like Sam was indicating for the electric grid by cyber attacks, now, what happens if there's, you're in Arizona and you have three days of heat in excess of 120 degrees? So you're going to have you know, distribution fires in your distribution transformers. You have significant line sag. Um, the pumps that provide water are now going to be working faster and they're going to be hotter. So those are going to break down. So those types of questions that we're also uh, asking and answering. Have you been working with HECO? Uh, HECO, I know some of the folks at HECO, but we don't have a joint project together. Because you know they had a demonstration project and I'm and it was ONR funded mm -hmm. at the downtown facility that's kind of sort of half offline, um, and they just finished it and it's with one of the partners with HNEI, so it'd be really interesting to have you guys talk. Right, that'd be good. I wonder if it's the project. Is it a storage project or what was it? No, it was exactly that a microgrid project. Um, oh, interesting. Cyber defense. Okay. And it was ONR funding and then PACOM funding, and um, it's a local company that came out of the Manoa Innovation Center. I'm trying okay. To remember the name. It starts with an R. That's good. I'll talk to I'll talk to Rick about that oh, actually. Rick about That's that. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that idea. Um, and one application of this was actually looking at the entire electrical infrastructure in the United States. This is at substation level and up transmission, so it's 69 uh, or 69,000 uh, uh, volts and up. And then uh, simulating the effect of uh, future loads with getting it hotter, where people are going to be living because they're moving around the country, and then looking at where we're going to be violating uh, national standards in terms of how much power can you put through lines because they're hotter. And we realize in different sections of the United States, you're going to have more or less issues. And then we can provide that guidance to utilities, uh, regional transmission operators, and other groups on where you would do future investments. Um, we translated that knowledge around the world. So with the Global Consortium for Sustainability Outcomes, ASU is a member and helps with management of this. So there's 13 different members uh, around the world to help provide and disseminate the knowledge and noting that every conversation is an opportunity to learn as well as share. And so we've learned significantly from these groups as well. And I think, I think that's a conclusion. Uh, we've already talked a little, quite a bit about workforce development. Um, this is support by the Economic Development Administration to translate some of our training to the Navajo community uh, as the Navajo Generation Station closes, which is a coal-fired power plant. I think, yep, this is our support, uh, support and partners. Uh, we're happy to lead a lot of work, but we work with a lot of great people. And then we have a collection of advisors from the private sector, humanitarian sector, and the defense sector. Um, as again, a lot of the technologies and the work we do have more than one application. And so our next uh, review of all the work is going to be in March. We're going to have a 50-person event hosted, uh, hosted by us to really focus on, on five of our programs. So it's pretty excited. But we're very happy to be here today. And uh, Sam and I are open to answer any questions you might have or other comments. Great. Thank you. A lot of information there. Questions, comments? I'm seeing the 20 yeah. hours of training that you referenced that can mm -hmm. be done online. Is that, a, is there a link you can share to that or 
how somebody would sign up for that? We're developing that right now, and that'll be ready uh, maybe not early summer, but mid-summer. And so at that time, um, if we could tag up afterwards, we'd be happy to share information on that with you. This is very solar-focused, solar um, so I'm wondering if you've explored microwind at all, mm. but, and then also blockchain as, ah. as an enabling technology for microgrids. Thanks, Chad, for those questions. Uh, the first one on wind technologies, uh, so for us, um, solar, any type of thermal generation, and then storage has been the main focus in power assets, including building technologies or controllable loads. Uh, wind, given our location in, in, in Arizona and most of the places where we would, uh, we've worked, isn't, doesn't have high as efficacy as, uh, as wind does. Uh, so as a result, we're currently in discussions with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and they have a good amount of wind in Alaska, about adding, they would add the wind component into a larger training program. Um, it's interesting, so in the blockchain world, it's uh, an interesting concept. Um, it's been applied often in uh, the financial markets, um, but in energy infrastructure, it only has one proven uh, use case and application out there, which is also, uh, it's in Brooklyn, and it's a relatively modest form of what blockchain could do. Uh, so what we've done is we partnered with BlockFrame. This company right there is a... Uh, 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 a crypto security company in Colorado. It's actually former Deloitte employees that commercialize some IP. And what they'll do is, much like you have that chip on your credit card, so they'll take, the numbers are on the back, so unfortunately if I'm not getting recorded, no one can take my credit card information. <laughs> um, that chip, they will, they're creating this chip for us, and then we are jointly creating the algorithms that will go onto it, and then these small little chips will go onto DER devices, so distributed energy resources, solar inverters, battery technology, et cetera. And then jointly we'll have the distributed trust and security there. So that's ongoing work we're doing. We're gonna have the prototyping done and tested in the test bed in Q3 of this year. Uh, with the um, intended outcome, not only are you preventing people from getting in, but sometimes people still do get in, uh, every, despite everything you do. So then comes the question of mitigation. And the Department of Energy awarded some work to a colleague of mine, also in collaboration with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, to say, let's say you have a, a, a dis uh, solar inverters on a network, and 100 of those are out there, uh, 30 of them get attacked, and you don't know which ones they are, and you can't stop them from being attacked, and so they're now nefarious devices. How do the other 70 become aware of these rogue agents and then change their control pro uh, programs or parameters in real time to counteract those nefarious devices? And so that's the sci more of the science-y stuff we're doing right now, which is likely gonna be a 2020 test implementation. Yes, Merrill runs the Smart Cities program here at East West Center. I just wondered if there's anything Meryl, from the work that you've been doing with all these various global entities like MasterCard and others, anything mm. that relates on the energy side that you think is of interest? Uh, I mean, eventually um, we hope to do that. I'm not sure we're going to get so into the weeds. I mean, we'll be looking for collaborative partners, too, in terms of doing training. Um, mm. But what we're focusing on right now is really much more of a, a large scale, more of a visioning um, in uh, cities in Southeast Asia especially, sure. um, for them to understand uh, the different technologies and how, what, and how their uses and how you can become smart hmm. um, and where to start. And um, there might, you know, I see that there'll probably be a lot of synergy down the road as we start to do that. Um, actually, um, Arizona State University, I'm going to be there in... Um, I'm going to be in Phoenix at the end of this month, okay? Um, because they, um, they're, uh, I'm taking a training and actually a master class in smart city uh, development. Oh, nice! Which is uh, mm. they're partnering. Uh, this organization is actually based in Scandinavia, but they're partnering with ASU, um, mm. and so there is, uh, you know, I see that down the road there might mm. be a, a lot we can do with um, workforce development um, in, uh, in, South, in ASEAN countries. That's great. And as you're, um, during that visit, if you have a couple hours and I would enjoy catching them for coffee or coming over and doing a tour and seeing some of the stuff, we'd be yeah. more than happy to yeah. host you. All right, well, sure. after you're this talk, ahead. I'll get your okay. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Perfect. Oh, okay. Good. Yes. Fantastic. And Christina, I wonder, Christina runs the leadership programs here and has been doing some really interesting testing with 
online, just giving cost. You know, you bring Asia Pacific leaders into Hawaii and then you schlep them about the place and it becomes very expensive. Mm. Um, so Christine has been testing some online, some face to face and some online. And I just wondered if you had anything to share now that Nate and Sam and the team are putting more of their content online and Sam, given your personal experience. Very interesting, this idea of how do you keep people en engaged and what role might a coach, either, either a real one or an AI sure. coach, have? So, Christina, I don't know where you are. I know it's relatively new for yeah. you. No, I'm particularly interested in this model, and we've had to look at that specifically in our work in the Pacific Islands. So I, I'm really mm. thinking of that as you're speaking in the the capacity and the interest, but not the scale there, and then the cost of flying them out for right. training. I mean, I, I think this, uh, right now we run, we run a series of community leadership incubators on seven islands in the North Pacific um, with women, and um, I'm thinking um, how how integration of of actual trainings rather than general leadership training, how that, that would partner there, but really excited about this work for that constituency. Yeah. And Layla, I mentioned earlier, has been doing work on resilience and was spent time recently in Australia and New Zealand visiting cities like Christchurch where we had the you know, yeah. seven on the Richter scale earthquake and there's still rebuilding going on. And I just wondered, Layla, if you could share a little bit what you'd seen in Australia and New Zealand relating to microgrids. And my question is a little pointed with regards to New Zealand, where I'm from, because we have so much hydro. We're 95% renewable in terms of power, uh, and there's, there's very little solar, even though we have a lot of sun. So I was just interested to see from a, a, a disaster perspective, what is the resilience planning for power outages after disasters? Yeah, actually, I didn't get to see a lot about microgrids. Yeah. It's unfortunate. But it seems that um, they're thinking a lot about utilities. And, um, you know, someone from Wellington Water was here uh, just not too long ago and talking about what they're doing in terms of, of um, increasing access. Um, equity is a big part of, of this equation. And I think microgrids is another way that we're, we're allowing everyone to participate. And places all over the world are looking at that. New Zealand is a great example. I'd like to see more of that here. So I'm very excited that you guys are here. Thank you. Great. Mm. Any other comments, thoughts? I've just wondered if you've uh, been meeting with the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center and Dr. Kim, Paul Kim. I don't know Dr. Kim. If you'd be interested in making an introduction, it'd be Absolutely. very great to chat. You should be partnering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know Hawaii was designated as the uh, Pacific National Disaster Preparedness Training Center mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's ONR funded, um, and they carry on trainings. That is their main focus. Okay. Um, and they've moved into the um, post-disaster as well. Sphere. So mm -hmm. there's a tremendous... That's great. That be yeah, because uh, in particular with the the resiliency training, uh, given the potential uh, diagnosis or identification of threat vectors, but then yeah. after disaster, the the response and then also the recovery as you move from what is sometimes also called contingency to enduring operations. So that would be super informative yeah. uh, to have a conversation. But Thank he's, you. He's here on campus. He's here on campus. Okay, excellent. See, we should we should have scheduled an extra day for all the stuff. I know, stuff that would but it's, come up. it's amazing. I mean, Hawaii is a relatively small place, but this is the mm. first time I heard of that. Either. And, so, and oh, Sam and I incredible. and more more people from my team. So we had we uh, we brought eight people from Arizona State this week for the the week's activities we were doing. Uh, but we're we're here roughly every two to three months, and so this now um, uh, yeah, provides a, a list of things to do next time, uh, or potentially even do sooner, which is great. And I do think I'm a great fan of the Rise tool. I love these good acronyms, but the fact that Hawaii dodged a bullet with hurricanes in the last few years, just what would happen to critical infrastructure? Um, so anyone else who can help be a proponent of us getting the rise tool into some of the uh, city and county and state mm -hmm. planning, um, that would be, I think, a really helpful <coughs> scenario for Hawaii to go through. Maybe Jody, with all her contacts, can help with that too. So. 
Yeah. And she's part of the team. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. I know